We're welcoming today in person, finally, <laughs> Associate Professor Simon Honigman um, from South Africa, from the University of Cape Town. Um, and she'll be talking about uh, developing a screening tool for common perinatal, menatal, perinatal mental health conditions um, for high prevalence low resource settings. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce um, Associate Professor Simone Honigman. She's the Visiting Africa Oxford Un Initiative um, Fellow that I'm hosting and that we're hosting in the department, which is very exciting. <clears throat> and she's um, by training, she's a medical doctor with clinical experience in pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology and psychiatry. She has a master's degree in maternal and child health. She's the founding director of the 21-year-old Perinatal Mental Health Project, um, which I really recommend you look up. It's very exciting. Um, it's based at the Center for Public Health at the University of Cape Town. And Simone led the writing of the WHO Guide for Integration of Perinatal Mental Health and Maternal and Child Health Services, published in 2022. She has received the International Ashoka Fellowship for Social Entrepreneurship and the Af Oxford African Fellowship. She has published 54 academic papers, five book chapters and editorials, and a book. Um, she runs a comprehensive mental health service integrated within public midwife unit of the Cape Flats. And her maternal mental health research includes topics related to gender-based violence, health economics, musical interventions, and mobile training applications. She designs and conducts training for a wide range of healthcare and social service providers, and is involved in developing films and other multimedia resources to support knowledge translation and capacity building. She consults to national and provincial health policy, guideline and program processes within South Africa and supports others' research, advocacy and training work on the African continent and in other low and middle income settings. It's my great pleasure to welcome today Social Professor Simone Honigman. Sound, someone said something about sound? The sound is actually, so I'll just ensure that everyone's reading. Okay, good. Thank you. Welcome, Simone. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's um, it's yeah, it's a it's a it's a real pleasure to be here. I feel very privileged and very excited to be an AFOX fellow for these gorgeous two months of spring and to be affiliated with your amazing department. And to be hosted by um, Nicole, who's been extraordinary so far. I've already been here two weeks, almost, yeah, two weeks, and it's been wonderful. And today, um, and to hello to everybody online. Um, I think this is the camera that's looking at me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's quite weird looking at the little box. Um, I hope we're going to have some rich discussion. I hope there'll be some chats, uh, chat questions coming through. Um, I'm not too sure if you're okay, but I feel comfortable with people interrupting because sometimes there's a point of clarity. I know not everybody here is involved in mental health or this kind of work. So I'm really happy for people to interrupt and ask for questions for clarity um, as, as we go, just so that it makes sense. And then at the end, we can get into some more meaty discussion, if that's okay. So um, I'm going to take you down a journey today on how... We and why we developed a, a mental health screening tool for common perinatal mental disorders in South Africa. Um, the process by which we um, integrate, how we got this into the routine service of the country, mm -hmm. and some of the problems why about why uh, around it not being implemented. Um, so even though we've worked incredibly hard over many years. Um, there's not a lot that's happening with respect to, to screening and service um, expansion. And I want to speak about that, why it's not happening, and what we're doing to mitigate against the fact that um, implementation is far from, from ideal. Um, so we will start with the why around the enormous service delivery gap in our setting, the research that we undertook to develop a tool that would be fit for purpose for our setting, how we worked with our Department of Health, the processes by which we engaged, um, and then looking at some systems considerations um, around, around supporting implementation or and barriers to that as well. So that's the journey we're going to go on today. Some context, um, in our setting in South Africa, we have an extremely high prevalence. 
um, similar, maybe a bit higher than the prevalence um, found in other low and middle income settings. We have about one in five women will have depression, about one in five women will have anxiety, and about one in three will have both mm -hmm. in the perinatal period. And for the purposes of definition, we speak about perinatal as the time from conception, so throughout the pregnancy until one year after the birth of, of the infant. Um, and yeah, there have been just, just regarding prevalence in South Africa, there have been several studies conducted, prevalence studies conducted, and it's really important when one looks at prevalence data to interrogate the tools that were used to establish that prevalence. And very often tools are imported up from outside of, of the, the set, from outside of settings, um, uh, outside of, of the settings which they're intended to be to be used, and there uh, the tools are screening as opposed to diagnostic tools. So we have to interpret the data with respect to the to those problems with detection. There really is a big problem with detection, and one also has to look at detection of maternal mental health problems with respect to detection in a research setting versus detection in a real world everyday maternal and child health setting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, the real world, what does it look like? What do our maternity services look like? They're overburdened, like those in many other countries all over the world, and particularly low, low resource countries. Um, our frontline workers are, are often um, extremely busy with high burden of a, a high patient burden. Um, they um, there is a huge under under resourcing in 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 nursing and midwifery across most of our maternity care sites. Um, the quality of of those are the frontline workers really for for maternity care on the whole. Although we have cadres of community health workers that are slowly being inducted into taking on some of some of the basic maternal primary health care work, but on the whole, frontline medical officers, midwives, and, 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 and nurses are overwhelmed, and they've had rudimentary training in mental health, rudimentary training. And in fact, there's some terrible news recently. Our, our nursing curriculum for the country has been re revised with a view to attracting more nurses into the profession and employing more nurses more quickly. And so they've reduced by about a, a third, a quarter of a third, the duration of that curriculum. And in doing so, they've removed the entire module on mental health. So uh, uh, given the data and the prevalence, this is extremely bad news. Um, OK, we have um, we have, however, a high uptake of maternity services in our setting, which is good news. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had about 94 to 96% of women during pregnancy using maternity services throughout the through, at least once through the duration of their pregnancy. And most would have a mean of about three visits during their pregnancy. And um, what what is what is what is interesting, though, is, is to compare that to other low resource settings. Where, for instance, in Uganda, only one in four women will use a maternity service during pregnancy. So in South Africa, even in rural settings, there is a culture of using facilities, facility based care on the whole. It is slightly dropping, so we need to keep an eye on it. But so we have this extraordinary opportunity. We have an entry point to care and our whole idea around integrating mental health into maternity care, which is our vision, um, is that we have a platform for this to happen. We have women coming anywhere to our services and we have women undergoing screening for all sorts of pregnancy related issues. Why not screen them on mental health at the same time? Um, and that was, however, there was no screening tool that was routinely available. And when we started our pilot service, Way back in the early 2000s, um, at, um, at a maternity hospital in Cape Town, we decided to use the EPDS. I don't know, has everybody here heard about the EPDS? 
Okay, some haven't. It is the sort of standard depression screening tool developed in Edinburgh by this wonderful man, John Cox, um, who uh, that has been used all over the world. It's been validated in tens of different <laughs> countries and languages, and it's a screening tool that's the kind of gospel of perinatal depression. So we thought, well, let's try it. And in fact, there were two validation studies conducted in South Africa. However, it didn't work. It didn't work in the real world setting. There are 10 items, that's too many. It had a Likert system, which is poorly understood. And in fact, since then, there is more and more literature coming up that's showing how Likert or multiple choice questionnaires are not readily um, interpreted in the way that we intend them to be interpreted in non-Western settings. The whole concept of having a choice, the whole idea of having some of the time, none of the time, all of the time, most days, some of the days, those kinds of concepts are not understood in non-Western settings. And there are all sorts of different ways that we can try and get around it. We can try and simplify the language. Colleagues in India have to you, you can do visual analog scales. Colleagues in India have, have shown a, a glass um, with degrees of fullness of some liquid inside. Um, but it doesn't work. And the scoring system is also highly problematic. We found even very senior midwives who were doing the scoring, there's reverse scoring of some of the items. They made mistakes, huge, huge mistakes in the in the calculation of the scores. It wasn't a useful tool for us at all, and the idioms were not culturally appropriate. Things getting on top of me um, is a very <coughs> being bothered by, although that's from another tool, um, feeling not seeing the funny side of things. These are idioms that are used in the tool that people have accepted all globally. But in fact, if you ask a person, what do you understand by things getting on top of you? Instead of saying, do things get on top of you some of the time, all of the time, none of the time? If you ask a person what they understand by the, the concept, well, that's how I got pregnant. <laughs> or, or, um, it's not really, it, the idioms are problematic, especially, and they were, they were certainly in the South African setting. So what we needed was a valid tool. It needed to be psychometrically and cognitive, psychometrically valid in terms of sensitivity and specificity yeah. with a rational choice for a cut point. Um, and it needs, it, we needed to have a diagnostic gold standard against which we could test it. We needed a brief tool. It was practical. It needed to take a very short amount of time. And we needed to have a binary or dichotomized scoring system. We also needed the tool to be culturally appropriate. And then after developing this tool, uh, we needed to work on, on a way of routinely integrating this into the standard history taking procedures at booking, which is our first registration visit during pregnancy and potentially at subsequent um, contact points thereafter. So our objective in our research project was to develop this brief mental health screening tool. We wanted to cover both anxiety and depression because we um, at the time anticipated and it was proven to be true that anxiety was equally prevalent um, to depression, often comorbid with depression. And especially in, in, in our setting where we have a, a woman who is exposed to chronic trauma, the experience of anxiety and various forms of anxiety, it, um, it needs to be taken into account. And we'd also done some work on suicidality, and we'd found there was a high prevalence of medium to high risk suicidality, even in women who were not depressed. So, in fact, 40 percent of women who who did not qualify for a diagnosis of depression were in the medium to high risk suicidal category. So we wanted the tool. We had high ambitions for this tool. We wanted the tool to do to fill all of these functions. Um, and we also wanted to be able to be used by non-specialists. And we did this work in two phases, and this is where we did it. We conducted it in Hanover Park, which, as you can see from the mountain, is about 15, 20 minutes from the centre of town. 
about 15 minutes from my office in 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 uh, in Rondebosch, which is a suburb of, of Cape Town. I don't know how many of you know Cape Town, about 20, 25 minutes from the center of town. This is an area within the Cape Flats, which is this huge swathe of land um, that were where a whole lot of townships were developed as part of the apartheid architecture of the city. And people were displaced from their homes, put into these um these settings forcibly under apartheid rule, and they remain a, a legacy um, in current time of just of, of adverse, adversity and disparity. And this is where we have our service site today. It's at a midwife unit in the centre of this um, this area. This is an area that was reserved for so-called coloreds or mixed race people. Um, they had slightly better conditions than the areas reserved for, for black people. At the, it's becoming more and more integrated now. There's probably about a 40% population of black people compared to, to, to colored people. You can see those council houses, rows and rows and rows of them in the background, often tiny rooms with two or three families in them, huge levels of gang violence um, and, and drug uh, abuse problems in the setting, a lot of domestic violence and food insecurity. So in that context, we wanted to generate the best screening tool item. So at the midwife unit, we recruited just under 400 women at their, anti their first visit, and we, we threw all the anxiety and depression screening questionnaires that we knew or we thought might be contest, contesters at them. These poor women underwent screening with um, these, these, all of these questionnaires that had been validated in the South African setting. Um, they were the high contenders. Um, and what we then did after giving them some tea and coffee and a food and a break is we uh, we administered a diagnostic assessment. And this is very important. A lot of people don't do this, but we used a diagnostic neuropsychiatric interview with a trained registered counselor. Um, and we so we could use the diagnosis as a gold standard. Mm -hmm. All of these tools as a whole were analyzed against a mini diagnosis. Um, and also individual items were analyzed against this diagnosis. We then conducted a multiple logistic regression and receiver operating analysis for psychometric properties. And this has been published um, in Global Mental Health. I can send these slides to you. So our results were um, just looking at, and I mentioned this already, this is just the prevalence of the conditions that we were seeing. Um, and, the, and the papers behind, it, behind them, but as I mentioned, there was there was high comorbidity of of both major depressive episode and anxiety. So what we what our regression showed was that four symptom items were most strongly predictive of depression and anxiety, and these items came from the Huli, which is also a similar item in the PHQ nine, which is the most commonly used primary care depression screening tool in general, in adults. So the Huli and the PHQ-9 item on being bothered by feeling down, depressed or hopeless. And during the past month, have you been bothered? Being bothered is a very British concept. If you think about it, what bothers you might not bother me, um, irrespective of whether we, whatever country we come from. But these performed well. And then over the last two weeks, being bothered by not being able to stop or control worry. And then the item on EPD from EPDS10 on self-harm. Um, we had to binarize two of these items that were ready, that had originally been um, designed to be um, multiple choice. So you can see, have a look at our rock graph there. I'm not too sure if any of you are familiar with this analysis of validation. It's the standard. I see some nods, some shakes of heads. Yes. No, I have a question to ask. Yes. Sorry. Um, when you said you had to binarize two of the items, yeah. um, was that in relation to the issue that you pointed out with the Let Like It scale? Or, yeah. And you didn't do it for all, you just... Well, two were already binarized, oh. and the other two that were not. So the entire scale then became binary? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 
Thanks. Thanks for that, for that clarification. So you can see we've got a good area under the curve of above 0.8 for those four items, and with a cut score of two or more, we had good sensitivity, specificity, and um, yeah, so our psychometrics look good for those four. Mm -hmm. And this is where um, we didn't stop, thankfully, because we undertook a cognitive interviewing study, um, which has also been published. At the, do people know about cognitive testing or cognitive interviewing as a method, as a research method? Yes, anybody? Yes. Not so much. OK, so this people often don't don't do this. In fact, I've seldom seen people do this when they validate screening questionnaires. And if you don't, you miss the elephant in the room. And that's exactly what what we realize. Cognitive <laughs> testing, it's assessing the degree of match between the intent of the questions and how the respondent interprets the questions. And it's utterly critical. I mean, I've got a, got a very good friend who does this all over India, and she's, you know, she does this in respect for maternity care tools. And it's they kind of, if you don't do if you don't do this, you miss um, enormous discrepancies between um, people's cognitions at who who are receiving the tool and those who've designed the tool. So how do how do how do respondents interpret? We want to know how do respondents interpret these questions in their own lives, from their own experiences and perceptions. And it's a systematic technique involving an in-depth approach to assessing the validity of both the content and the structure. And it's important to understand that. And I'll speak to you about that and what that means. And it distinguishes theoretically between four stages of thinking in response to questioning how a person understands it, how, what in memories it evokes, how the person assesses, how is able to assess the, the, the concept and how they respond to it. So in order to prepare for the study, we initially, we just from a face validity point of view, decided we needed to adjust the culture bound language. It's things like being bothered by it, we changed. We did a formal translation um, back and forward and back of this tool in three languages, and we used both mental health professionals plus frontline workers who didn't necessarily have a mental health specialist background. Um, and what we did then was we recruited um, pregnant women at the unit in three languages, and we administered the tool in their first language, and we did iterative cognitive interviewing with several of them to examine their responses. Um, in the first phase, we had 29 participants, um, and we realized that one item, the item of anhedonia, pleasure, was very poorly understood by almost, or not under, was, was appreciated in a way that was very different from how we appreciate it as mental health people. Mm -hmm. And we also discovered that the recall period, and it was important that we asked, what do you understand by the past two weeks? And some women said, oh, that's when I got pregnant. So the last two weeks referred to the time from conception. Some, for some people, the last two weeks referred to a period of about two or three months. So the time recall period also needed to be, we had to, we had to change the language. And um, we found that, yeah, so the four week recall period was not well understood, but a two week recall period was. And we had to, we had to check out this just anhedonia question. And we reanalyzed um, the, we did a reanalysis of the three, four item tool without it. And it still performed pretty well. So what we did with this ultra brief mental health screen, as you can see, this is what we were left with. Um, and I'll speak to you in a minute about the, the and over there, um, is that we took the new three item tool and we didn't have the funds to validate it against a diagnostic tool, but we validated it against the EPDS. And um, we considered again the psychometrics, and we found that with this new tool, um, if you use a cut point of two out of three, you have very good sensitivity, specificity, and uh, correctly classifying. And about one in five women would require 
uh, referral. And we felt even that might be quite a high ask um, for a setting where there are very low resources, but we were going to try and see what happened because we anticipated from our experience that a lot of women wouldn't take up the referral. So um, that was our tool. Then the next step is working with the Department of Health. Yes. I have a question in terms of referral. So how did you define a cutoff point in your screen that would then classify for referral? As you have, for instance, with, with PHQ-9 or with others. Like that. Yeah. Um, I'll just go back to that. So, so that would risk. So, so here, this, um, we well, if you look good. at the different cut points over there, I probably went through this too quickly, but these different cut points have different associated sensitivities and specificities. <laughs> so a cut point of three out of three is not sensitive enough. Um, um, and a cut point out of one, th one out of three is not specific enough. So this is the sweet spot in terms of adequate, um, adequate sensitivity and specificity, um, and that that would generate a, a twenty percent referral rate given the background prevalence that we knew. And these are both high risk and medium risk, or any kind of risk you just refer? So because this is only a, it's a very brief outer tool, it's not it's not designed to pick up levels of risk or change. It's just designed to be mm -hmm. the first filtering of women into care. And if we have time, I can speak about how our own service has worked to, around this very rough tool. It's a, it's a crude tool, but it's better than the EPDAs. Um, it's a crude tool that we have then had to integrate a second level of screening okay, for thanks. where there's a, a deeper assessment of risk and needs and triage to, to levels of care that women need. Sorry, just to pick in that, I'm with you as well. This one, two, and three, this is just the number of answered questions because we now we are asking three questions. Yeah, it's people will answer yes to one of those. We are here if they answer two. Correct. Regard, so they're all equal, the three questions. Uh, there is no waiting. There is no, so they're all, yeah. Whether you answered yes to number one or to number three, it doesn't matter here. Correct. However, one because of the because of the suicidality yeah, concern, the one, number three. In our instructions around yeah. the tool, we have suggested um, from an ethical and safety point of view that any endorsement of that, irrespective of the overall score, requires a referral. Yeah. And the reason why we put the and in there is that many women have yeah. thoughts yeah. have suicidal thoughts. Um, and that would flood the service if any, any endorsement of that item. So when we put thoughts and plans, so we thought we added that and just from a pragmatic point of view, um, if you've got thoughts and plans, you require a referral. A really good result, I think, from risk assessment point of view for three questions on a yes and no. And then yeah. so very well done. Well. You'll see. <laughs> so how did we work with the Department of Health? This shows in a way, even though it's circular, it's it's messy. I didn't I should have I should have a diagram that shows you that it's not linear and that we had to go back and we had to go forward and we had to build relationships with people in the Department of Health. From the maternal directorate to the people in ECD to the people in mental health, we had to become friends with everybody. And then they change, and then there's new staff, and then you have to make friends with them. We had to explain what is maternal mental health. Do you know we have this as a problem? And, you know, what are the issues? A lot of people, you'd, you'd be surprised at the mental health literacy, the poor mental health literacy in the Department of Health. And we had to really work collaboratively with a lot of stakeholders. We had to invite ourselves to every party. We had to sit in every committee. We had to um, offer to help the sort of work alongside the Department of Health in order to, to convince them that this was a useful thing that we were developing for them, by them. Um, so we had to convince them around acceptability and feasibility. We had to speak about costing. We had to speak about outcomes. We had to work around this issue of referral resources. And we were very concerned about the ethics of not of not being of screening women and not having a place to refer them to because our mental health services are 
extraordinarily um, under-resourced. We have less than 1% of our health budget going to mental health. Sorry, less than 3%, just under 3% of our health budget goes to mental health. There's absolutely nothing that's specifically allocated towards maternal mental health. So you have a sense that of how things might work if a woman requires referral, it's whether there's an NGO next door, whether there's a social worker in the day hospital um, or a, a, a mental health nurse who might or might not be able to see them. So we had to really think about that. Um, and we've also, part of what we do at PMHV is trying to build the capacity of all those people to take on these kinds of referrals. Um, and we also had to convince frontline workers who may not have access to training that simple empathic engagement at this point of conducting the screening tool it is in and of itself a therapeutic process. So, and that's been borne out in, in several studies where um, the one arm of the study has just had a screen with no intervention and the other arm of studies have had a screening plus an intervention. And it's been shown that just, under, just undergoing a, a screen, if it's done with compassion, can be therapeutic in and of its own. So we've been working to build, to build that process. So we, as I mentioned, we had to know about what are the policy gaps. We had to offer to write some of the policy or review some of the policy. We sat on committees. And most importantly, we got on the stationary committee, the maternity stationary committee. And this was a small group of very dedicated um, workers. And this is the stationary. I'm not too sure how it works here. It's a long time since I've worked here. But these are um, booklets that, that record a woman's health process throughout her pregnancy and afterwards. Every visit she has, every test she has, every result she has. Um, it actually has the partogram, the, the birth, the birth. Everyone knows what a partogram is. Um, so, and and there was a, deci a decision to revamp this and we've re we, we decided, can we put our screening tool in there? And because we knew the people, they said, yeah, put it in. So, in fact, it was that easy. So the screening tool is now in the stationery that every single woman has. It's her little Bible throughout her pregnancy. And, um, and we actually were man managed to infiltrate a whole lot of other mental health and respectful maternity care and all sorts of other issues into the stationery as well. So, um, so this is what the case record looks like. It's called the MCR, the maternity case record. That's the opening you know, the front page, and then on page four or five, we have our screen. Um, and that's what it looks like. Um, there's a preamble um, so that it gives a script to help the worker <laughs> engage. We ask, uh, we use language to help introduce the this, this screen, and, and, and it's phrased in a way that's respectful and hopefully destigmatizing. And then there are a set of instructions that we also put in the in the question in the in the paternity case record. So you can see that it's right there and then the person, the screener doesn't have to think they know exactly what to do. And you can see that that question on suicidality is clearly signposted there. Um, and then just to, just one or two points to help the health worker normalize, normalize mental health issues um, to help women. Um, take up the care that might be offered to them. Um, and these are the kind of messages that one we would hope anybody could get across, and that can be quite powerful. Um, we've got some loose ends with the screening tool. We need to validate it further with other language groups, rural women, adolescents. And in fact, we found we see a lot of adolescents in our, in our service, and we find that this tool does not work for them at all. Sadly. So we have to do another, we have to develop a tool for them. They're fine, they're fine, they're fine. And I think it's to do with an adolescent orientation. Yeah. So sorry. No, no, please. So what is the gold standard here in that assessment? Is that that EPSC? Sorry, I'm new to that. Yes. Yeah, or what is the gold standard where you say it doesn't work for adolescents? It doesn't, we've just noticed it doesn't work because we have made a, a, a decision in our service design to see all adolescent women. Yeah. irrespective of their screening scores. And we find that their screening scores are zero. Uh -huh. 
out of three. And when we speak with them, they're not fine. The gold standard is professional assessment one to one. Yeah. Um, we also would like to assess whether self-administration may or may not work or whether it's it would be better if different sorts of workers administered it. We'd love to look at whether it's it's just suitable on a digital platform. And most importantly, we need to supplement symptom screening with risk factor screening. And that's been endorsed by the World Psychiatric Association and um, the Marseille Society and various other bodies which have which have demonstrated, and there's a lot of evidence to show, it's a whole different discussion, but if you look at risk, you know, are you hungry? Are you being beaten up? Do you have a support person? Have you had a major life event? Do you have a past history of mental health problems? If you supplement your yeah. symptom screening with risk screening, you get a much better picture of where the person is. And even if there's zero on your mental health screen and they have risks, you can still offer them care and either prevent, so it could be a preventive intervention, or you can prevent things from getting worse. So you mentioned stigma a bit earlier, which you know must play a role in everything you do, basically. To what extent do you think that stigma is different for, for teens than it is for older women? Uh, you know, adolescents um, are just more likely to say, oh, I'm not going to answer yes to that because... I mean, I think with ad, with adolescents, there are all these overlapping issues. There's a stigma of being pregnant, so there's a double stigma. Mm -hmm. Quite often, there's a there's a kind of a, 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 the their ordinary emotional vulnerability is heightened. Um, they're defensive in this setting. They are they, there's a there's a huge sense of mistrust of health systems, of parents, of schooling systems, of peers. Um, and um, so we're pretty sure this is this is not fit for purpose for for adolescents, and and perhaps a screening tool isn't. Perhaps no screening tool would be, and it needs to have. We need to think laterally about how to screen adolescents in, or we need to see them all. Um, we also need to look at audit of screening quantity and quality and how we can do that in an everyday kind of real world environment. And we need to build that referral platform. But this is the bottom line that I think if we put aside all of this academic work, and I've alluded to this already, people spend a lot of their careers and their PhDs and their research funding to develop a screening tool that can be beautifully valid on paper and in the research setting. But if it is administered by somebody who themselves is suffering from mental health problems or exhaustion, or they've got 40 women to see and they haven't had a tea break and it's lunchtime, if they're irritated and they're used to being, um, they're used to a very dismissive hierarchical approach to engaging with clients and women, that tool is going to be useless. So the way in which it's the way in which screening is conducted is as important, if not more important, than the items itself. It's about the relationship that one has with a person when one's speaking about mental health issues. So despite it being in the stationery, we're not across the continent, many people have, have given screening tools to mm. nurses and midwives and, and, and health officers in maternity settings, and on the whole, they don't use them, whatever they are. And we looked at, you know, colleagues in Ethiopia did work looking at the barriers and enablers. Uh, there's issues not unpredictable, and these are these are barriers and enablers that that uh, resonate with with many 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 studies across the world where people have looked at that. There's low mental health literacy of the screeners themselves. Why am I doing this? You know, what for? Surely we don't have mental health problems in, in our setting because people think mental health problems is only psychosis. Um, there's low awareness in the community. There's a lack of s systems readiness by the government. Um, there's a lack of policy and guideline um, uh, mandate. But enablers were the MH Gap program, which is a World Health Organization mental health gap action program, 
which is a, a manualized way to approach mental health in, in ordinary healthcare settings. And simplicity of screening um, is also an enabler for some settings. And in South Africa, we ourselves did some research and then Brown and Sparag did some research looking at, at barriers at, at the different levels. So, of course, as, as one can expect, there's issues around stigma, real concerns about lack of confidentiality from, from the, both the providers and the users or the patients. Providers themselves often feel great discomfort in speaking about mental health. It's often too close for comfort because of their own mental health issues. Um, it opens up a whole can of worms. I don't have time. What, if I ask her how she's feeling, I'll give her 25 minutes. And you can have a look because I want to show you some film. I want to quickly go through the rest. You can have a look at um, these other barriers that I've mentioned. Um, enablers are just having the screening tool right there and then. So some people have said it's useful. It's right there. It's part of what I do anyway. Some people have, with training and engagement, have really have perceived the importance of detection and treatment, both um, and and have found that. It is useful to have it in the in the paternity case records. So, as I mentioned, it's about the how more than the what, um, and that screening in itself may have therapeutic functions. We need to train screeners in the rationale of what we're doing around confidential. That should be about their confidence. We need to work with their confidence in in doing the screening. What are their boundaries in terms of their responsibilities. They don't have to treat necessarily or manage or solve problems to keep it contained for them. We need to we, we need to train in kindness and empathy. We have a huge and, and I see you smiling in the back, but we have a huge problem in South Africa and in many other countries of obstetric violence. And this the other word for that is disrespectful maternity care, disrespectful care. And there is a kind of culture in our maternity of, of being of, aggress of aggression and rudeness. Um, so we really need to, and we've worked very hard to try and undermine that. Um, we uh, need support for the screening staff themselves, and we need to increase the emotional literacy and, and, and mental health literacy of service users through innovative mental health promotion approaches. Um, so what are some key considerations at structural level? We need to look at policies and guidelines, um, and these are things um, that we need to ensure if we're going to have screening happen on the ground. Um, we need to have screening supervised. The human resource issues, we need to have human resource practitioners part of the discussion. It needs to be part of the KPAs in somebody's job description. KPAs? key performance areas. If, if you have to, as part of your job, deliver babies, dip the urine, take blood pressures, it needs to be in the job description. People need to be assessed against, their performance needs to be assessed. It has to be, the systems have to support that. Supervision, people who supervise juniors have to know that you need to supervise not only how they take blood pressures and measure the height of fundus, but how they do the screening as well. And there needs to be health information systems and audits. How many people is this unit screening? We need to look at social risk factors and promote mental health for providers themselves. So, um, um, Genesis Choi Sugnai from Malawi has developed just some, some examples from elsewhere in the world where they've done re some really interesting work. Um, he has developed a brief, uh, a brief screening tool that's against a diagnostic gold standard. So this has been done elsewhere. We need to look at cultural adaptations, cognitive testing, feasibility and accessibility. And what's very interesting is looking at this combination approach of using emic and etic, uh, etic constructs around mental health. Does everybody know what that means? Local constructs of what is mental health. What are the, the cultural terms, expressions, feelings about being depressed? For, in, for instance, in Isiklosa, which is a, a common language in South Africa, the word depressed doesn't exist. Um, and people would revert into English, but they would speak about 
um, having something in your stomach, thinking too much. Mm. Um, so using emic uh, constructs to develop screening tools that come from the local environment and perhaps combine them with etic approaches. You know, what this idea of lack of pleasure, this idea of low mood. These are the approaches that come, these are the concepts that come from the global north. Um, in Zimbabwe, Vikram Patel many years ago developed the Shona, Shona symptom questionnaire, which was a mixture of, of EMIC and ETIC. And Green and, and colleagues in Kenya conducted this very elegant study um, using both a combination of uh, um, local idioms and Western criteria. And it's really, really worth reading the, way, the beautiful way in which they, they brought together experts and they decided on which items to put in their tool. Um, and then Watson carried that forward in terms of, of in Kenya as well. Um, and then in the last three years, so it wasn't being implemented. Screening wasn't it being implemented. So what did we do? We worked on policies. And there are two new, newish policies, the mental health and the maternity policy, which now has meant maternal mental health deeply embedded because we invited ourselves to all of those parties and we offered to do some of the writing and we were nagging, harassing and pushing and making friends, some enemies. And now, and also we similarly with guidelines, we've written guidelines, the WHO guidelines are out. A lot, a lot of governments consider these to be important. Um, and the maternity guidelines, we're busy finalizing as we have been finalizing for the last three years. Um, but hopefully that will give, um, give some concrete ways in which, in, in which um, people can roll out um, screening. So I'm going to just show you some, an example of the films that we've made. Um, I'm just, I'm going to finish this quickly. I just want to, before I show the films, I want to acknowledge all these amazing people, especially the woman who agreed to be our research participants, um, the research staff, the staff at our unit in Hanover Park, the Department of Health and all our extraordinary funders over the years have got us there. And please reach out and connect with me if you'd like to, but I will be around in the next, for the rest of the month. If we have time later, I can speak to you about our service but, and, and show, you, show you how that works. So I just want to stop the, that and show you this film that we've developed. There are four scenes in this film, and this is scene three out of four. And we designed these, this film with a view to with a view to them supporting the maternity care guidelines, which says women that nurses need to screen all women, um, and and to to address some of the issues that we've discussed. Okay, so I'm going to be asking about emotions. You must answer yes or no to each question. In the last two weeks, have you on some or most days felt unable to stop worrying or thinking too much? I mean, I'm thinking a lot about how I'm going to take care of my baby, support with food and clothes, and I'm worried that my boyfriend might leave. So that's what I'm scared of. Did you tell anyone about this? No. Okay, it's not that bad, yeah? It's good. In the last two weeks, have you on some or most days felt down, depressed, or hopeless? <clears throat> I don't know. I, I don't think so. I just feel very stressed all the time. Like I can't do any of my responsibilities. Like I want to, but I can't. Like I just don't leave the house. Since we also have a lot of work to do, did you see how many patients are still in the waiting room? You wanted to do grown-up things, son, so you must be a grown-up now. You have to force yourself to do these things. You're having another baby. Didn't you learn the first time? Hey. In the last two weeks, have you on some almost days had thoughts and plans to harm and kill yourself? No. You think things are hard now? They're gonna get worse when the baby comes. Do you understand? Good, so do you need to see a counsellor? But I really don't think so. Your situation isn't that serious. 
Sissy, do you need to see a counselor? No, I'm fine. Okay, I'm gonna go and get some stuff to examine you in the here. I uh, should just show you the talking points. These, um, so the, these, <laughs> slide, these films for trainers, um, and we wanting these are the sort of talking points that trainers can use with their, with their um, uh, participants in the in the in the training. Could I please have Charlene Adonis? Folder forty one. Hi, Charlene. I'm Sister Olafir. Is it okay if I call you Charlene? Yes, okay. thank you. Please follow me this way so we can talk more privately. So how was it getting to the clinic this morning? Mm, I'm quite tired. It was mm. quite a long journey. I have to try and help. So, so I'm getting my dog. <laughs> Sure, Charlene, it sounds like it's been quite a, a difficult morning. Okay? So we will discuss some of those things later. But for now, if we can maybe begin with your medical history. Mm -hmm. So if it's okay with you, I would just like to ask you some questions about how you are feeling. And this will really help me think about the best way to support your wellness. Okay, but these questions that I answer, are you going to tell anybody about it? Okay, so you don't have to answer anything that you're not comfortable with. Okay, so all your health information is confidential, except if I am worried that you are a danger to yourself or to others, I will need to tell somebody so that we can keep you safe. If I can start with the first question, have you on some days or most days felt unable to stop worrying or thinking too much? Well, I'm thinking, thinking too much sort of about how I'm going to support the baby, you know, with like food, clothes, all those things. And like, I'm sort of worried that my boyfriend might just leave me. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things I'm scared about. Yeah, I understand this can be a very difficult time and it can feel, you know, like it's too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Charlene, in the last two weeks, have you on some days or most days felt down or depressed or hopeless? I've noticed that like my body feels really heavy, like my head is just full of thoughts. Like I'm just thinking all the time. Mm. It sounds really difficult. And also it doesn't sound like you're spending time with family and friends. So many women struggle with these sad feelings and too much worry during pregnancy. But you know what's amazing is that even though you had such a difficult night and morning, you still came for your clinic appointment. And for me, that's really great. So well done. Yeah. So just the last of the questions, Charlene. In the last two weeks, have you on some days or most days had thoughts and plans to harm yourself or kill yourself? No, no, no. I would never do that. Mm. Um, it does sound like you are struggling with your thoughts and your feelings and how you are doing things. Um, okay. And we know that when women have extra support, you know, that it helps them, you know, to manage tougher situations. It also gives them a sense of just how strong and resilient they are. Okay, so here at our clinic, we have Dr. Habani, and she sees our maternity unit patients on Wednesdays, and she's really good at listening. Okay, then we also have a counselor who works at the community health center just here in Proteus Street, um, and she's there on, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm going to pause there because of time. But the rest of the thing, the rest of this film goes through a process of how to facilitate a referral. And in our training, that's an essential part of, of what we're wanting to teach people. Again, how you refer to, will determine whether women will take up the referral and use the referral. So there's kind of an ideal way in how to refer. 
So I just want to end up saying thank you very much. I know we're on the hour already. We've had a few questions, but I'm not sure if there is time for any more and if there are any that have come through. Yeah, thank you very much.